Well, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 17th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2024. Uh, the first item for the committee's consideration is whether to take agenda items three and four in private today. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. And our principal uh, item of uh, business this morning uh, is to um, have a look at the Scottish Government's approach to financial interventions and particularly to um, uh, inquire into the operations of the, uh, the Strategic Commercial um, Assets Division. And uh, I'm pleased that you're joining us this morning uh, to help illuminate uh, that question and uh, to answer others that we may have. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Gregor Irwin, who's the Director General uh, of Economy in the Scottish Government. Uh, and alongside Mr Irwin is Colin Cook, uh, who is the Director of Economic Development in the Scottish Government, and also Dermot Rattigan, uh, who's the Deputy Director of the Strategic Commercial Assets Division at the Scottish Government. Um, as I said, Director General, we've got some questions to put to you, but before we get to those, uh, can I invite you to make an opening statement? Thank you very much, Convener, and thank you for the opportunity to give evidence uh, to your committee today on the Strategic Commercial Assets Division. As you've already noted, I'm joined today by Colin Cook, Director for Economic Development. Uh, Colin oversaw the creation of the division also by Dermot Rattigan, who's been leading the division since the start of this year. Uh, the creation of the division uh, was an important step in our work to provide the right capacity and uh, commercial expertise to manage the government's strategic commercial assets effectively, as well as managing a portfolio of interventions in which uh, ministers have a stake. The division also coordinates the government's response to companies in distress. It does this in close collaboration with the enterprise agencies and with policy officials responsible for individual sectors. Uh, the division is a cornerstone of the assurance system and collaborates with finance, legal and subsidy control experts to assemble robust evidence and advice throughout the life cycle of any commercial intervention. As accountable officer for the Scottish Government's strategic commercial assets, I take a significant interest in their management, as you would expect, uh, as well as being directly involved in key decisions and advice to ministers on these assets. I also chair the Strategic uh, Assets Review Group, which provides internal challenge, assurance and guidance to the officials who lead on our interventions. We work closely with Audit Scotland to improve our processes and our frameworks, and we regularly take their advice. I supplied some material to the committee uh, before today, which summarises the work and structure of the division, and I hope that was helpful, and we look forward to taking your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director General. And can I begin with that uh, briefing note that you sent to us uh, in advance? Um, it included a, an organogram. Uh, with uh, people's job titles and so on in it. Uh, could I just ask how many people work in the Strategic Commercial Assets Division? I might ask Dermot to give a quick answer to that question. We have around 40 at the moment, so the, it does flex a little bit, so we have people coming in and out regularly, but it's around that, that number. Okay, and where is it located? It's part of the uh, Directorate for Economic Development. So the venue of that is... Uh, spread between uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh, okay. Atlantic Key and St Andrew's House. Okay, so they're not all together in one office? No. No, they're not? No. Okay. How much is the budget for the Strategic Commercial Assets Division? Dermot, do you have that figure to hand? We, I don't have the, if you're meaning the, the salaries of the staff, I don't have that exactly to hand, but we also have uh, money that comes into the division which we use for procuring uh, specialist commercial advice. Uh, and then also money flows through the division, which goes to um, the businesses that we're working with, uh, particularly Ferguson Marine. And that, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Convener, I was going to say we can write to you with the uh, precise total operating cost of the division, if that's helpful. OK. But it doesn't have a standalone budget, for example. Uh, it doesn't have a standalone total operating cost budget. Collins Directorate uh, does, and it is part of that directorate, but we can identify uh, a figure for the total operating cost for the division, if that's helpful. Okay, 
Okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Raskin, you mentioned about um, uh, procuring expertise and so on. Yeah. And I noticed that one of the uh, functions of the Operations and As Asset Management Unit mm -hmm. is to procure the services of commercial advisors. I mean, these are consultants, presumably. How much money has been spent in the last 12 months on consultants? We, the, in the year 23-24, uh, we spent £1.6 million pounds on commercial advisors. Okay. Um, and was that all in connection with Ferguson Marine or was that in connection with other ventures? No, it's, it's not just Ferguson Marine. So we, we, ha we retain advisors uh, that support us on the Le Carver guarantee. We retain advisors that support us around Glasgow Prestwick Airport and thinking about the future of that asset. We do have advisors uh, for Ferguson's too. So they're, they're primarily thinking about uh, what the future of the business is. We do retain from time to time uh, technical advisors on shipbuilding matters and things like that. So it's a range of, range of those uh, things that come together to get to that total. And you mentioned the expenditure for the year 23-24. I mean, what was the expenditure in 22-23, for example? Is it going up or is it going down or is it staying more or less the same? I don't have that figure to hand. That I, I've just joined the division since January this year, but we, we can certainly get that to you. Uh, I just don't have it uh, with me today. And, and could I ask, I mean, how, how do you measure whether those consultants are performing well or not? Oh. Sorry, Jim. Uh, so uh, we are very careful to use consultants in the right circumstances. I think we're conscious of where we have um, capabilities within uh, the division and elsewhere within the Scottish Government. Of course, we work very closely with um, experts uh, in the legal advisor team subsidy control uh, and elsewhere. Um, our first port of call is to internal sources of expertise. Uh, we draw on external uh, commercial or legal or technical advisors uh, where we think there are gaps in capability that need to be filled for a specific purpose uh, for projects uh, that are important that really do demand that type uh, of attention and we do everything we can to ensure that costs are kept under control. There are some circumstances where independent external advice is very important. So for example if we do due diligence uh, we can quite often do an initial due diligence internally, uh, but if we're really going to rigorously test um, uh, 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 a piece of analysis uh, or a set of forecasts or something of that sort, then there's an important role for independent external advice. And of course, uh, in some circumstances, we operate in an environment where there are legal questions that need testing and, and, and sometimes independent <coughs> legal advice is important as well. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, this committee is considered before the due diligence of uh, the um, uh, situation in Ferguson Marine with the uh, construction of uh, the vessel 802. And uh, that was a report conducted by Tenio. You outsourced that to Tenio. Uh, and, of course, you will be aware that there has been a recurring concern of the committee uh, that that um, uh, was a report uh, which was uh, covered by a kind of non-disclosure agreement uh, at the instance of uh, Tenio, I think. So there is, a, there is a broader concern I think this committee's got about the extent to which you're relying on external consultants, uh, which means there is no public scrutiny of the work that they are doing, uh, which is paid for by uh, the public purse. So we do um, use uh, non-disclosure agreements. Um, they, they are with companies rather than individuals. Uh, I think I'm right in saying, uh, but my colleagues can confirm this, in almost all circumstances, it's at the onset uh, of a project so that we ensure that any information that's shared at that stage remains uh, confidential. Um, and uh, in the specific case of the Tenio uh, report, um, that um, was a piece of commercial due diligence. Um, it uh, did concern uh, the underlying cost structure and productivity uh, of Ferguson uh, Marine. There were elements of that which 
are commercially sensitive. Uh, we understand and want to support uh, as best as possible uh, the needs of the committee to ensure uh, transparency in all circumstances. Uh, and we're aware that there is um, a, a tension between that objective and preserving the commercial, uh, um, uh, commercially sensitive information, which is important for the competitiveness and therefore for the s sustainability of Ferguson Marine as uh, a business. And we, we are um, always uh, reviewing whether we get that balance right. Um, and uh, in fact, as I believe the Permanent Secretary wrote to you, we are reviewing our approach to transparency more generally just to test and ensure that we are getting that right. Yeah, yes, I think um, uh, later on in this morning's session, we might get more into that uh, perceived tension between the commercial interests that the board of FMPG have got and their responsibility to be accountable uh, through the uh, Scottish Public Finance Manual, um, not least because I think the last count, a quarter of a billion pounds of public money had been put into <coughs> Uh, the uh, company. So let me move on to um, uh, ask you something else. So when um, uh, when we uh, asked the uh, Auditor General to uh, kind of re review what uh, the Scottish, uh, the Strategic Commercial Assets Division was, he said it was to increase capacity to respond to cases that arise seeking support. Um, when um, I think um, I uh, questioned you back in January, Mr. Irwin, you said um, that it was about uh, commercial expertise required to manage strategic um, assets effectively. And the instance which I uh, raised with you at the time was the Grangemouth refinery. And uh, I asked whether you considered the Grangemouth refinery to be a strategic commercial asset and was that being considered? And I think that was the point when you said our job is, the, the job of the assets division is to manage existing assets. I mean, can you just explain a little bit more about um, how proactive or reactive the division is and, and what it does to Horizon Scan and so on? Yes, so th there's, there's quite a lot in uh, that question. So, um, and as the letter that I sent to you before uh, today sets out, um, <coughs> the, the division does fulfil a number of functions. So that begins with Horizon Scanning and... Um, uh, 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 developing market uh, intelligence and understanding of businesses that are potentially in distress, working with the enterprise agencies and ensuring that if businesses in distress do come to the Scottish <coughs> Government or to the enterprise agencies, that we have a framework in place and we have an approach to ensuring our ministers get the best possible advice in those circumstances. So there is an important role for the division working with enterprise agencies and potentially with uh, relevant policy leads uh, across government. In the case of Grangemouth, those policy leads are in the uh, Director uh, General for Net Zero's uh, area, so we work closely uh, with them. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that the division has done is to establish uh, a framework mm -hmm. governing um, <clears throat> the whole life cycle of intervention, starting uh, with the decision to intervene to provide support directly to a business like Ferguson's or like Presswick Airports. Uh, in addition to that, as part of that life cycle model, um, uh, th there's an intense focus, as you would understand, uh, on the management of those uh, commercial assets, and that does take up a considerable amount of Dermot's time, Colin's time and my time, because of the importance of Presswick Airport and Ferguson Marine, and indeed uh, managing our interests in Le Cabre. Um, uh, so that, 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 that um, element of managing uh, those interests, uh, working uh, through the sponsorship teams um, and ensuring that we have the right frameworks for good decision making in place and allocating resources when required, that's important. The last element is actually about the end of the life cycle, looking to ensuring that um, <clears throat> there's a sustainable future for businesses, um, the presumption in the case of Ferguson's and in the case of Presswick Airport, is that we will return those assets to the private sector at the appropriate time. That requires a different skill set, a different uh, approach and framework. And one of the achievements I would suggest of the division has been to develop that and to do it in quite a consistent and rigorous way, taking advice from Audit Scotland as and when appropriate. 
Okay, and again, we're going to get into uh, the kind of divestment uh, process um, uh, a little bit later on. But can I, I mean, again, can I just come back to the situation in Grangemouth? I mean, have you got people in the Strategic Commercial Assets Division uh, today or over the last month or in the coming weeks who are actively involved uh, in looking at uh, an intervention uh, around the future of uh, either the import terminal, which you mentioned when we took evidence on this previously, or, or on the continuation of a refinery at Grangemouth. I mean, it's the last refinery in Scotland, isn't it? So we've not been asked to intervene to support uh, Grangemouth. Uh, any request would have to um, satisfy the business investment framework, which is now part of the SPFM. Uh, and colleagues in the Strategic Commercial Assets Division, of course, have been very much involved with uh, colleagues in the finance side and elsewhere to ensure that that framework is as robust as it can be. Um, but one of the roles of the Strategic Commercial Assets Division is to ensure that we're always ready to make sure that we apply the principles and the detail of the business investment framework in any circumstances we're called upon uh, to do that. Um, the, the, um, the, the policy lead for Grangemouth, as I've said, it lies with DG uh, Net Zero, but we work closely with colleagues there. And uh, our, our principal interest is to make sure that should there be any request of any sort, uh, that we have uh, both the capabilities and the expertise, but also the processes in place to uh, deal with that in the appropriate way. But is what you're saying that the people employed in the assets division stand ready but are currently not doing anything with regard to Grangemouth. Just for, for, for clarity, we do have people in the division who have supported our colleagues, as Gregor said, that um, the lead comes from uh, the, um, the net zero side of the business. We have people in commercial assets division who have supported them and have given them advice, and we would stand ready should the decision be taken to do something to move an asset through, of any type through that life cycle that Gregor described. Okay, um, uh, just really finally for me, you've mentioned a couple of times the expression in distress. Could you define uh, what you mean by in distress? How do you, you know, how do you decide that a business is in distress and may require intervention? Uh, so um, Dermot may be able to provide more of a sort of uh, technical uh, uh, definition of that, but typically uh, a business in distress um, it, there might be two issues, one of two issues. Um, the business may have made a, uh, may be um, suffering from financial underperformance uh, or liquidity uh, problems, uh, which means that the business um, finds itself in circumstances where it, which might need to lead to job uh, losses or, or, or a closure of part of the business or the business or its in its entirety. There's a slightly different set of circumstances where you might have businesses that made a, a strategic decision to exit from a particular location, uh, or potentially from Scotland uh, entirely. Uh, in either of those circumstances, we may well find uh, that the business um, comes to us, either very often through uh, the enterprise uh, agencies, uh, or in some circumstances, um, uh, 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 we may come into contact with them by other means. But in those circumstances, uh, one of the primary roles of the business briefing unit, which is part of Dermot's division, is to ensure that we're able to uh, brief our ministers and advise them on the likely impact uh, of uh, the decision that that business uh, is uh, taking, uh, the impact on jobs, the impact on sec the sector, the impact on the local economy, the reason for it, so whether it is a cash flow problem or a strategic decision, uh, and then um, what sort of support uh, the business is receiving or may need to receive. And that could come from uh, the enterprise agencies or, or in some circumstances if there are job losses from PACE. Okay. I mean, would you consider a business to be potentially in distress, a strategic business that's important to the Scottish economy, if it was the subject of a hostile takeover bid, for example? Uh, in those circumstances, um, the, the, the policy uh, framework around takeovers is a reserved uh, matter. Uh, there are also is a framework for considering any national security concerns 
concerning takeovers, uh, and that is also a reserved uh, matter. Uh, so I'm not aware of any circumstances where we've uh, been called upon to uh, participate in a, in, a, in a process involving uh, a company in those circumstances, but either of my colleagues may uh, be able to say more. Perhaps not. I'm not. No, I'm not aware of any situation where a hostile takeover has been the thing that's precipitated our intervention. Um, I think they, they come in in the two ways that Gregor's mentioned, either because the business is suffering in some way and we've picked up that they have liquidity issues, or, and this is quite often the case, it's just a restructuring. They've decided that a part of the business they no longer want to do, they want to exit in some way, and the Lacabre guarantee, that's how that one started. So Rio Tinto were in touch with us. They said um, <clears throat> they wanted to look at their operations mm -hmm. in Lacabre, at first, the discussion we were having with them was around the energy assets. They wanted to get those connected to the grid. As they evolved through their own strategic view, they had decided that they wanted to exit that business in Scotland. And they spoke to us about that. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't driven by distress. It was just that Rio Tinto had decided to focus more of their resources on mining further upstream and less on the, the downstream production of aluminium. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to now invite uh, Willie Coffey to put some questions to you. Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, Gregor and, and colleagues. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Scottish Government, uh, particular investments, and mentioned Presswick <laughs> because I'm an Ayrshire MSP. And firstly, I, I'm delighted at the intervention that took place 11 years ago to recognise the strategic importance of Ayrshire, and it's great to see the airport returning to profitability with more routes and so on and so forth. But the intention, of course, which was stated at the outset, was to return it to the private sector, and perhaps the other investments that we've made too in that time uh, is, is uh, most appropriate to do. But could you give us a little flavour of the policy intention behind something like that and driving it back towards profitability? Um, is there a tension between doing that for its own sake, compared to the demands and needs that the local economy may wish and demand. If you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it's, we want to return it to the private sector. So that has clearly led to a number of actions over those 11 years that does make it profitable. But what's the balance between getting, that, getting it ready for returning to the private sector? and the operational nature of the airport and what it can and should be perhaps in the future? So I think in the case of Presswick Airport, um, we have made very significant uh, progress. Uh, the business has returned to profitability. Uh, so operating profit in 22-23, 2.1 million, profit before tax of 0.8 million. Um, that intervention uh, did secure the future of Pressway Airport. We wouldn't be where we are now without it. Um, the airport currently employs 338 staff directly, so a very significant employer in the region supports many jobs uh, through the supply chain as well. Um, I think one of the... I understand the committee's visited the airport recently. Is that... No, that's going to be... No, this committee. Oh, sorry. Um, economy. Economy. economy committee. If, if anyone has had the opportunity to visit the committee, it, it is a very vibrant uh, business. Um, and um, there, there are many different elements to the business model that they operate. And I think that has um, been an important part of the success of the business in returning to profitability, but also making the business more sustainable and also ensuring that it remains firmly rooted uh, in the South Ayrshire uh, economy. Um, and I would suggest that for those reasons, e even as we look to the future of Presswick Airport, we do have a number of expressions of interest in the business. Um, uh, th th there really is a, a good opportunity uh, to return it to the private sector at the right time, in the right circumstances, uh, but in a way which really does preserve um, its important role uh, within the local economy. And it's, 
it, it's down to the hard work of the employees and uh, the, 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 the leadership team at Presswick, who over a number of years have really helped to turn that business uh, around. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic uh, that we're in a good place just now. We never take anything for granted. Um, certainly any potential tension there of the sort that you've described, our ministers will be very alert uh, to that and in our advice to them, we'll be very alert to that as well. Um, uh, but part of the success of the business in recent years has been its ability to uh, diversify uh, and to really establish strong roots in the community as well as a good international customer base. Mm -hmm. If I may, I mean, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm very conscious in the way, or I'm, I'm aware of the fact that the board in managing the business are, are, are very conscious of the role that they play in the, uh, in the local economy. Um, as you know, we've been um, undertaking a review of that recently and study into that to, to really start to try and quantify the impact that uh, our investment in the airport has had on, on the surrounding region. I think perhaps the best insight into how we try and manage that um, tension as you described it is in the criteria that we would apply um, for anybody who was interested in acquiring the airport and that's been very firmly um, that uh, we would be looking for a partner that has experience of running an airport and has plans to run an airport and I think that's a sort of demonstration of um, the perspective that we take that this is a, you know, an asset of national importance and certainly of uh, local and regional importance and we wish to protect it. If you, if you speak to people in Ayrshire and, and further afield as well actually they want to see more, more and more flights operating from pressing. I mean I use it as regularly as I can once a year and I support the airport and always have done, always will do. But so people always ask me, why aren't there more flights coming to the airport? And that's a decision that, that can be taken by the management team, whether to pursue that or not. Um, there was also talk about the developing the old part of the airport, which I was I had the pleasure of visiting. It looks like walking back into the 1960s. But the plan was to try and develop that as a hotel, like a hotel for, you know, to service the, the economy and so on. But that's never came forward. So it's in those kind of areas, are those the kind of things that have been potentially hampered just to get it back onto the profitability scale? And could these things happen um, looking to the future with a possible new buyer? And would the government have a view of that? I think that the board is constantly looking for, for new and profitable opportunities, and it's got some very um, strong commercial relationships with with, with Ryanair, for example, who fly um, from the airport and use it as a base for, for, for training. So they're constantly looking for those kind of opportunities. It's a competitive market. Um, they obviously have to uh, um, have a product that, uh, that works commercially for, for any potential partner, but they're always looking for those kind of things and um, you know, opportunities to use the airport and its, its land for, um, for, 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 for purposes that fit that, that sort of perspective of what the airport should be used for, and they, they would definitely be looking for. So we can, we can give you that guarantee that they are constantly looking for things that can enhance the profitability and enhance the impact that Presswick has on the local area. Any, I mean, I'm probably talking too much about Presswick, but it really applies to the other investments too. Mm. Convener about just looking beyond the current situation and with a potential buyer coming in for any of these assets, Will the government, does the government retain a view about what that asset should be and should develop into the future to look like? Uh, because at the moment you hand over the asset to a, a private owner and it becomes the ownership of that, that, it could completely change. So what kind of guarantees or assurances would the government be seeking uh, if to hand their assets back over uh, to protect and preserve what has been done and been delivered locally for their economy? So if you take, take the case of Ferguson... Marine right from the start. The reason for intervening in Ferguson Marine was to ensure the delivery of the two vessels uh, because of the important role that they play in ferry services for our island uh, communities, uh, but also to preserve jobs, ship, commercial shipbuilding uh, on the Clyde, uh, and because of the economic importance of the yards uh, in Inverclyde. So those broader objectives were articulated uh, right from the start and they remain important now as we look to secure 
sustainable future uh, for the yards. Um, it, it needs to be able to succeed commercially. That's the that's the you know an important requirement for long term sustainability for the yards. But there need not be conflict between those objectives. But certainly our ministers uh, are mindful of uh, those uh, uh, wider objectives and and all of our advice to our ministers, uh, we ensure that that is given due prominence. Mm. Just my, my, my question here on how, do, how does the government ensure, uh, assure the Usher public, for example, about any future sale of Presswick, that it continues as a, an airport passenger aircraft, air traffic and so on, and all those kind of services, because surely any new buyer may, may, may wish to take it in some different direction. So would the government have a say and guaranteeing that operational capability in any future sale, do you think? Sorry. Yeah. In the case of Presswick, we've, we've been very clear, as, as Colin's already alluded to, that uh, you know, as we seek expressions of interest uh, in uh, the airports, that we are looking for uh, potential uh, uh, parties who, who are willing to commit to its future as an airport, as an aviation asset. Um, and recognising that it is uh, almost a, a unique asset in many regards because of the sheer size, the scale uh, of the, the runways at Presswick and its location. It has a number of advantages. Um, so we're, we're confident that um, uh, the, the airports, um, right at the core of what makes it attractive to those potential bidders, is the fact that it is an airport but also one that has particular sources of competitive advantage. The, the long runway is the longest in Scotland and it's the longest north of Manchester. And that means that it's attractive to um, certain users. Uh, and also it has other advantages as well, the ability to receive flights um, with fewer restrictions than, than, than some other airports makes it attractive to cargo customers. And all of this is important to creating um, a sort of scale of operation uh, through the diversity of sources uh, of revenue and customers as an airport, but the sort of scale of operation that makes it not just viable commercially, but attractive commercially. But that the importance of the of Presswick remaining an airport, an aviation asset that's rooted in the community um, with suppliers right across uh, South Ayrshire, that is very much uh, part of uh, the process that we are engaged in. As that proceeds, um, and if we get to the point where we're looking at a decision, uh, a recommendation uh, to um, accept uh, an offer to purchase Presswick airports, uh, then at that stage, we'd look to see what we could do in order to firm up uh, the commitments that would be made as part of that process. But right at the start of the process, we'd be looking and testing uh, 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 the seriousness of uh, potential bidders uh, for Presswick uh, in ensuring uh, its future as a, an aviation asset. I think it is worth remembering that we have turned down, or the government has turned down, in expressions of interest or take, not taken the expressions of interest any further, um, where we do not believe that there was a clear business plan to retain the airport as an operating airport and where the people behind the bid were not, uh, didn't have the sufficient level of airport running experience that we would be looking for. So I think we've already demonstrated that that's very much in our thought process. And, and if, sorry, if I, if I may, you know, we, we, we do have criteria that we use. So, um, you know, a clear business plan backed by finance, um, also a track record of running a business of this sort. Um, you know, really, really good ideas for how to make the best of this asset as an aviation asset in future. All, all, all of that uh, is, is important uh, from the start of the process through to the end of the process should we get there. Reassuring words here and I thank you for, for that. Just finally for me, could you know, just in general, um, how, did, how are the public assured that the continuing investment by the Scottish Government in all the assets um, is value for money? Um, provides that value for money that, that we see. So we'll continue to, to retain assets and invest in them to keep them 
operating uh, price week is profitable, but how does the public get the assurance that the, the money that we spend on, on all of the assets that we've invested in is delivering that value for money uh, for the, the, the years to, to come before we can think about returning all of them perhaps to back to private ownership? Yes, so I, th I think this is one of the areas where the Strategic Commercial Assets Division really has uh, helped us to make improvements. So uh, the very creation of the business investment framework is part of that assurance process. So that is about ensuring that good decisions are taken uh, to intervene in the first place. Also the creation of the Strategic Assets Review Group. I chair it, the Permanent Secretary, other DGs, non-executive directors, are members of that group. One of its purposes is to uh, provide challenge to what we're doing and, and also to ensure uh, that assurance uh, that that is there. Um, also, um, uh, the transparency and accountability through um, committees such as this is a very important part uh, of that process. And then ultimately, evaluation, evaluating uh, the um, the impact of our interventions, uh, that that's at the appropriate time, at the appropriate stage of the life cycle of any intervention, that is an important part of that assurance uh, uh, process. Thank you very much for your answers to, to those questions. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move things along now and invite uh, Graeme Simpson to put some questions to you. Graeme. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I just want to uh, go back to Presswick Airport, if, if I can. Um, I think it was you, Mr. Irwin, you said that there are a number of expressions of interest at the moment in the airport. Is that, is that correct? Yes. How many? I couldn't put an exact number we, on it. We haven't uh, revealed the number. Um, we, we've had, it's, it's definitely more than one, so there's yeah. multiple uh, ministers have said that, but they haven't wanted to uh, say, it's two, isn't it? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to confirm <laughs> that. And th there's reason not to do that now, because one, some of them might fall away, but also right. I think uh, for the, the people that are in the process, um, that's the kind of information that we wouldn't want to share with them at the moment, for them well, to know that, how much think, competition there was. Okay. Um, so I, th I think it's two, but whether it's another number. Um, <clears throat> so one of those bids... Or, or expressions of interest um, is um, headed, shall we say, by the uh, former chairman of the board. Is that correct? Yes. That, that is uh, correct. There has been interest. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think that's uh, appropriate that the former chairman of the board at Press Week should be heading up a bid? I know he's, he's the former chairman, uh, but he would potentially have sight of... Um, or have had sites of bids in the past that have been turned down? So um, he uh, resigned in January uh, when he submitted uh, that bid as part of a consortium. Uh, that was, of course, uh, important and necessary to avoid uh, any conflict of interest. It's a, it's a very important part of any sales process to ensure that there is a level playing field uh, between uh, different parties. We have uh, appointed commercial advisors to provide us with guidance uh, on uh, our future sales uh, strategy and, and legal advisors uh, as well. And th this speaks uh, to the convener's uh, first question about advisor, uh, advisor spend. It is very important uh, as we manage a process such as this that we ensure that we have the right type of external advice uh, to ensure that we rigorously apply uh, uh, the, the, the letter of the law governing this type of sales process and ensuring there is a level playing field is a very important part uh, of that. So we are, we're, we're aware of that issue. We're, mm. we're, we're, we're focused on it. We're confident that we've got good legal advice and good commercial advice. And we have a, we have a good framework in place to manage uh, this process to address any potential concerns of that sort. You can you can see the risk, can't you? You know, if 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 he or his bid were, were to succeed and another one wasn't, you know, that you could there could be a perception of it being a bit of an inside job, couldn't couldn't there? There are many uh, uh, 
um, issues that need to be addressed in a sales process uh, of this sort and we are confident that we are diligently identifying those issues, taking advice where advice is required and we've put in place a framework to manage them uh, in, a right, in, in the right way. Um, and uh, I, I think we're, we're in quite a good position just now in terms of uh, doing th that, but this is one of those uh, examples of where um, external commercial and legal advice is, is, is important, but that's in place. Okay. Um, now, you're very clear you want Presswick to stay as an airport. Uh, this business model at the moment um, relies a lot on freight uh, and military flights. So, uh, are you expecting someone to so retain that that current business model, or you know, would you would you accept interest from somebody who's saying, well, we don't want, we don't want to do it that way. We've got other other ideas. So, what, one of the strengths of the business in recent years um, has been the range of ways in which it's developed revenue from different types of aviation business. So. Yes, military flights, yes, um, uh, uh, freight operations, lots of potential for growth in that area. Also, uh, passenger uh, flights with potential to grow there as well. Um, th th it, increasingly, it's a business which is well diversified as, as an aviation business, and I would see that as a considerable source of strength. There's something really good there to build on, uh, and that's why it is attracting expressions of interest. Um, we, we would have an, a, a, an open mind, uh, and of course we'd welcome uh, creativity and further finance and expertise that could come into the business to develop it further. Um, but um, we, you know, we're, we're clear that we want it to remain as an aviation asset. Um, I want to ask you about Ferguson Marine now, so we'll get, we'll get off Presswick and we'll go on to Ferguson Marine. Um, there's a framework agreement in place now, I understand, but has that been published? The framework agreement bet between uh, the Scottish Government and Ferguson Marine. Um, there's an existing framework agreement which we uh, wrote back in March 2022. We've been working um, with the Board on a new framework oh. agreement. I understand that's been agreed by the Board now and we will be putting that to Ministers for clearance. Um, and at that point, um, it would be available for, for anyone to see. It's the kind of um, document that comes under Ferguson Marine's publication scheme around the way in which they run the business. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing that. Now, uh, Mr Cook, um, you and I were at uh, the recent uh, summit, as it was described, um, on Ferguson Marine held, held in Greenock. Uh, a very useful meeting, but a private meeting. So I'm not going to reveal what went on at that meeting, but afterwards uh, there were comments um, made, certainly made by the, the Deputy First Minister about the, the generalities of, of what was discussed. So one of the issues that came up um, was uh, around about uh, investment and future investment um, in in that yard. Now, I'm not going to ask you to reveal any any figures, uh, but we know that the government has t turned down uh, a proposal uh, from the previous chief executive. Um, it is uh, it has a new, a new set of proposals uh, from the current management. Um, has a decision been made yet? on whether the government is going to invest further money into the yard? A decision on the, um, on the business plans that were submitted by the board has not yet been made. Um, I have no doubt it will be made shortly and we'll be looking at the strength of those business plans, the opportunities that they identify, the costs that they have submitted, um, but no, no decision has been made at the moment. Okay, that's a bit of a concern because, uh, you know, I think we were all clear and I think the Deputy First Minister was absolutely clear that a decision needed to be made imminently mm. and, and this is now 
you know, several weeks away from, from when we met. So why is that decision not being made yet? I mean, it, it, it's a decision that we have to, to, to take carefully. Um, ministers will want to take carefully. There's a number of factors, and they came out at the, um, the meeting that you're referring to. Um, the, the, this is a complex decision. It's got to be right for the yard. It's got to be right for taxpayers. It's got to be right for the customers of the, the yard, both um, you know, particularly the communities that have benefited or will benefit from the ferries that they're building. Um, and ministers will take that decision. And I know that there's... Um, a, a continuing determination to take that decision quickly. And just, just to add to that, it also needs to be compliant with subsidy control rules. Uh, so yes. uh, this is an area where we do need to take, uh, we need to have external scrutiny due diligence uh, of any proposal for investment as part of a business plan. Uh, that does take time. So we are pursuing that as quickly as we can, uh, but equally we need to do it in the right way because it's not in the interests of the yards and the workers at the yards um, if there is subsequently a legal challenge uh, to a decision that is made. So it's important that we get it right. But with all due respect, Mr Irwin, we've known about this for some time. I had a, a written answer um, from the uh, former Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray in December. Um, I'd, you know, I'd asked him what subsidy control rules were preventing that initial the, the, the David Timon re request um, and he wrote back he wrote to me uh, the independent due diligence on F Ferguson Marine's initial capital investment request concluded that the initial business case would not meet the commercial market operator test which is a key legal requirement if we're to demonstrate compliance with the subsidy control regime, which you just mentioned. Yes. So have, have we not answered that question yet? Does, does... I think we're talking about two different business plans and two different investment proposals. So Mr Gray is referring to the initial business plan and the initial uh, investment proposal, uh, and the due diligence concluded that that would not meet the commercial market operator test and therefore yes. would not be consistent know, with subsidy know, control rules. I know, I know it was. This, the, 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 the more recent business plan was submitted on the 5th of April. Yes. Uh, and now that we've had receipt of that, we, we are um, uh, uh, pursuing the question of due diligence uh, and providing advice to our ministers uh, in the right way, uh, making sure that we get it right, making sure that it's not something that might be... Um, susceptible uh, to uh, legal challenge because that's not in the interest of the yards or, or, or workers at the yards um, and, and uh, we hope that that will reach a conclusion uh, soon. I, th I think we can absolutely say that and we're doing everything we can to do that uh, as quickly as possible. I understand that but surely the same legal issues apply to the previous request as this. Why? Same legal principles yes. apply but each time it must be tested based on the actual proposal that's being put forward. The test is whether um, the business case and the investment proposal uh, is something that a commercial market operator would actually undertake. So it's very specific to the actual proposition. So each time we get a business plan and an investment proposal, that needs to go through a due diligence proposal uh, uh, process so that we can be assured that it will actually pass and uh, meet uh, subsidy control rules. So you're waiting for legal advice on this. Is that what you're waiting for? Um, we, we are, um, we're, uh, we, we are um, getting to the point where we've got the due diligence in place where we can put that to our ministers. Um, it's, it's more the commercial uh, due diligence. The legal advice is clear, uh, to be honest. You know, I think we understand exactly what the position is uh, on the subsidy control framework, but it's because each specific business plan and investment proposal needs to be itself subjected uh, to that commercial market operator test that would require commercial due diligence to be undertaken. Uh, but I'm hoping uh, and expect that we will be able to um, uh, bring this process to a, a, a conclusion uh, uh, very soon. Mr Cook, are you able to give us a, a, a time, a, you know, any I idea? Is it going to be in, in days? I thought it was going to be in days, weeks ago. But... I 
I, I'm afraid um, I, I can't offer a, a definitive timetable, but I, I can again uh, assure you that we are hoping to bring this to a conclusion fairly soon. Okay. Um, I, I want to ask you something else that came up, and I think this may be the subject of, of a government initiated question, uh, but the small ferries uh, replacement program, which could, will, will be of uh, great interest to that yard. Um, has a decision been made on that yet? Um, that's a, uh, that will be a decision for the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, and uh, I do not believe the decision has been made yet. No decision yet? Okay. Well, if we see an answer to that question, which I think has been asked, hopefully the answer will be no decision has been made yet. If that's what sorry, there's is. a government-inspired question today, did you? Uh, well, sorry, I, Mr Simpson, I, I, I wasn't believe, aware of that. I believe that there the, the may be one. We'll wait, we'll wait and see. But you're telling us that no decision has been made on... I have not been informed of a decision by the Cabinet Secretary of Transport on that issue, no. Okay. I've just got one more question on, on Ferguson Marine, uh, and that relates to the new Interim Chief Executive, uh, Mr Pettigrew, who unfortunately... Uh, pulled out of that, that meeting that, that we had. Um, again, I had an answer. Um, I was asking about um, his relocation expenses, but I was told there was no... That he didn't get relocation expenses. He lives in Canada, I understand. But I was told uh, that his remuneration package includes a travel and subsistence allowance. So is the government paying for Mr Pettigrew to travel from Canada to Scotland? That, we'd have to get uh, information from the business on that. that that's, a, that's a contractual matter between the business and Mr Pettigrew. But there, there's not, he, he hasn't received a relocation package. He hasn't yeah. relocated from Canada uh, to, to Scotland. He, he lives in Canada. He's, he's got an appointment as an interim chief executive for six months, uh, and like all other employees at the yard, he's entitled to, to claim for travel and subsistence. Travel expenses from Canada. The, the details of that, I don't know what he has claimed for. It would be what would be he would be claiming for under his expenses. I, I don't have the detail of that, but he would be entitled to um, claim for expenses that he'd incurred as part of needing to be uh, here to undertake his, his duties in Scotland. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly like more details on that. I'll leave it there, convener. I mean, I'm tempted to ask, is he going to be flying backwards and forwards every weekend? I mean, how, I mean, how regularly would you expect somebody in that position to um, uh, draw down uh, the expenses they're contractually entitled to? That, that, that's something we can we can take that to the business, um, or if you want to write to the business, they would they would give you detail of that. But it is a it is a contractual matter. As far as I understand, he's not travelling weekly between Scotland and Canada. But I I don't know the details of how often he's made that journey. Okay, I mean, Mr. Cook, you attend uh, the board meetings of FMPG, don't you? Do you know the answer to those questions? I, um, I don't have the details of Mr. Trav Mr. Pettigrew's uh, weekly travel arrangements, uh, no, no convenient. Um, as I say the Yard can answer questions about the overall package that we, they put together in order to uh, secure his services for, for six months, and I know they'll be uh, you know, willing to, to give you information that they feel like, you know, that is appropriate. Okay, and what about his predecessor? Because Parliament was told that the um, uh, government had nothing to do with the termination of Mr Tyron's contract. Um, that looks a bit odd, doesn't it, given the government is the sole shareholder in the business? Well, oh, sorry, I was, I was going to say, I mean, the responsibility for the um, employment of the chief executive lies with the chair of Ferguson Marine, and it was a de the decision to terminate Mr Tyron's appointment was a decision taken by the chair with the support of the board. But the Cabinet Secretary told Parliament that she was informed uh, at least a week before, I think she was told in February, that there was murmurings about the performance of the Chief Executive and then a week before he was sacked, uh, she was uh, told about it. I mean, do, was she merely the recipient of that advice? Was there no uh, active role played by government in that decision? Could she have intervened to stop it if she believed that was the right thing to do? 
So the, the, the board are appointed uh, by ministers to um, provide strategic direction and oversight uh, for the executive team uh, at uh, Ferguson's. Uh, and very importantly, one of the uh, important functions of the board and the chair is to appoint the chief executive. Uh, so that is very much a matter uh, for uh, the chairman of Ferguson Marine. Um, uh, Ms McAllen, in her previous cabinet secretary role, she was made aware uh, on the 28th of February um, that the board was considering taking action um, uh, to address performance issues related to Mr Tideman's uh, tenure. Uh, the First Minister was made aware, former First Minister was made aware around that time as well. Uh, they, they were then later informed, I believe on the 18th of March, um, that um, he would be dismissed in the week commencing the 25th of March, and in fact he was then dismissed on the 26th of March. So ministers um, were informed and we were informed as well, but it's very much a decision uh, for the chairman uh, of uh, the board. And it's really important that we respect um, the, the roles and responsibilities of different um, parties uh, involved in Ferguson's, including the role played uh, by the chair. It wouldn't be appropriate for the government to interfere in the board's decisions regarding whether or not they have uh, confidence in the chief executive. But the chair of the board is appointed by the minister. Well, indeed. And is, and, and is directly accountable to the minister. He's appointed to do a job, yes, and this is part of his job. OK, OK. I'll leave it there because of time and invite Colin Beattie to put some questions to you. Thank you, Peter. I'd just like to explore uh, one or two things, some of which we've touched on. Let me ask a very obvious question. You've got various strategies in place uh, in connection with the, uh, the, the current investments. Is there an ex exit strategy in place for all three of the current investments that are being managed? Uh, so, um, I, I, I would put Ferguson's and Presswick in a different category from Lock Arbor. Uh, we, we, we don't have an equity stake in Lock Arbor. Uh, we've provided a guarantee in the case of Lock Arbor, and that's a long term commitment. Uh, we are confident that that's been an important intervention. It's secured jobs at the smelter, uh, more than 200 people working there. Um, again, many more people employed in the supply chain. We think our interests are well managed. We have a good suite of securities. Um, but that um, uh, intervention by the Scottish Government is managed in a different way from those other interventions where we have taken uh, well, we are the owner uh, of the assets, uh, as is the case uh, for Ferguson's and Presswick. But with Lock Arbor, uh, there must still be a, some strategy to have an end date for that commitment. Uh, well, the commitment is, is fixed in time, but it's a long-term commitment which, which has uh, many more years uh, to run. It's, it was a 25-year guarantee uh, starting from December 2016, so we're, we're into the eighth year of that now, so we're heading towards a third of the way through that. But is, it, is there no possibility of laying off that liability? No, it, it, no, there's not. It's an, an irrevocable guarantee. It has to be like that way in order to, um, for the business to raise finance, etc. So there's no, the exit strategy from the Lacabra guarantee is that it runs down over time. So the liability runs down over time. And at the end of the, the period of time, the guarantee falls away. Given that we're into that uh, liability now for a number of years, uh, has it been performing? Are we, are, are, is it going according to expectations? I think we would say it's performing well in respect of you know, its financial arrangements. So when, when we give a guarantee, we charge a price, um, we charge a fee. We are receiving that fee and we've all, the, all of the payments due to the Scottish Government are up to date and there's payments that are due to the third party bondholders who put up money to the GFG. All of those payments are up to date. So financially it's performing well. Economically, um, 
the guarantee has met its objectives in the sense that it kept over kept open the smelter. So when we spoke to Rio Tinto in 2016, um, they didn't want to operate the smelter anymore. It was the smallest smelter in their fleet of smelters, and it's actually one of the smallest smelters in the world. Um, they they put that asset on the market, and we we spoke to I think the five parties that Rio Tinto shortlisted. Four of them would have closed the smelter. They were only interested in the energy assets. GFG were interested in the energy assets. We made the offer of the guarantee available via Rio Tinto to all of the shortlisted parties. Um, and we did so. The, the, the reason to do, to do that was that GFG made commitments to keep the smelter open and to invest in the site. So they have kept the smelter open, as Gregor said. There's, there's around 214 people employed directly at smelter. There's a multiple, maybe two or three times over, of people that rely on the smelter in, in the, directly in the supply chain and then whose jobs are supported through the induced spending that comes from that. So we're meeting those objectives. The bit that we haven't secured yet, uh, Mr Beatty, is that the GFG haven't yet made the follow-on investment that we wanted to secure through the, the when guarantee. When did you give the undertaking? Well, what, what happened originally, and when we worked with the business... This is back in 2016. Then. Yeah, so the, the plan then, uh, and this was a business plan that we agreed with the business uh, to support the guarantee, was to invest in alloy wheel production. Those alloy wheels were to go into the UK car market. At that time, 2016, UK car production was at a peak of around... They were producing around 1.7 million cars in the UK. It's less than half of that now. Um, that is partly a Brexit effect, uh, and partly there was some of the other, some of the manufacturers had decided to move production to Poland and other places, etc. That we could see why GFG no longer wanted to invest in that business plan because simply the market for domestically produced alloy wheels had fallen away. Was there undertaking to invest contractual? They didn't have to invest in um, the alloy wheels plant. What they have to do is make an investment uh, of a certain scale. But they are, they are able, if, if the investment they were planning to make no longer looked viable, to pivot to alternatives. So we've, we've worked with them and we've supported them to scope out an alternative investment, which is around a billet plant uh, and a recycling facility for aluminium. Uh, that, that will produce fewer jobs than the original investment, but it's, it's less risky. Uh, and the product can go into many markets and it's not reliant on one or two buyers for the product. And when is that investment going to be made? I mean, presumably you've been in discussions for eight years. We have. So we speak to them uh, very regularly. We have quarterly meetings with the business. So they've secured, they've secured planning permission for the Isle of Wheels plant. They've secured planning permission for the billet plant. Uh, they have also been able to reserve funds uh, that we are able to see for that uh, development. Uh, I don't think they're ready to proceed until the GFG Alliance can get a global refinancing uh, completed, and they need to get that done with the three major creditors for the GFG Alliance. What's the time scale for that? That is a that's a decision between GFG and their creditors, but they are they've been hoping to do that, uh, you know, for a period of time. They they've partly done it. I think they've refinanced their businesses in Australia. There's other businesses that need to be refinanced before money can be freed up to come into Scotland for that there development. In, there is a contractual arrangement with the Scottish Government that this investment will be made. Yes. Is there a date by which it must happen? There's not a, there's not a fixed date. Um, there's not a fixed date to, to force them into uh, making an investment that may not uh, pay back for them. But they have to, they have to make an investment in Scotland uh, as part of the agreement. So it doesn't have to be in terms of Lochaba? No, it has to be in Lochaba. It has to be Lochaba, yeah. not just Scotland in general? No, sorry, it has to be in Lochaba. It seems an awful long time we're waiting for that investment. How much was it? So 
the investment that they had planned out for the alloy wheels plant, I think, had a capex of well north of £100 million. Um, the, the investment in the billet plant is a little bit uh, smaller than that, but I think it would be still approximate £200 million, uh, that kind of investment. It's quite significant. It is. And it's, in terms of the guarantee, this is what I want to emphasise, in terms of the financial performance of the guarantee, we are receiving the price that we were due to receive for granting the guarantee. So that, that part of what we wanted is secure. The, the part of the economic case that was built on the smelter remaining open, the, the jobs that are linked to that, all the jobs in the supply chain, and there's many, many of those. If you're up in that part of the world, you'll see, you'll see aluminium being moved around. Uh, on lorries, you'll see, you'll see trains going up to Fort William carrying all the alumina, etc. There's a lot of people involved in that supply chain. All of those benefits are secured. The bit that we haven't got yet is that the, f the flow on investment into uh, the aluminium plant at Fort William, and that's still to be secured. But we are, we are relatively confident that, that the business will make that investment. Relatively confident. How are you satisfied as to the good faith in this? But that's not the way I think we, we work with businesses. You know, businesses, they work in a very dynamic environment. Uh, I, I've explained why we saw that they, they had wanted to move away from the alloy wheels plant. We, we did a lot of work uh, with our UK government colleagues who work with the automotive industry. Uh, they had told us that, that the automotive industry wanted an alloy wheels plant in the UK. It was top of the list of the... the the supply chain that they wanted to bring into the UK, but that market simply, the automotive market in the UK fell away. Uh, and that's partly a Brexit related issue and it's partly to do with, uh, you know, movement to electric vehicles, all the rest of it, and churn in that industry. So, so we have to understand when we work with businesses that they are working in a very dynamic environment uh, and things change in their world. You're moving to electric vehicles, they still need wheels. They do, but, but they don't, they're not all being produced in the UK. So many of them are being produced elsewhere. So if you're, if you're producing a Mini in, in Germany or something like that, or wherever, wherever cars are being produced now, you want the supply chain to be close to you. So this, most, of, most of the UK car productions in the West Midlands, um, some of that ha has moved away. Okay, Com coming back to the more conventional investment where you've got uh, equity, in the, in the business. Uh, what are the ex exit strategies for them? Triggers reference that. So we've, we've talked about um, Glasgow Presswick Airport. So we have received uh, expressions of interest. That's been a successful turnaround. Uh, as Gregor mentioned, that business has returned to profitability. So it's now attractive. Yeah, but receiving, the the, receiving bids is part of the result of an exit strategy in itself. It's not an exit strategy. So, the, well, ministers have been clear on the objective. So the objective, they do want to return that business to the private sector. That is one of their objectives. But they also want to see... That's a headline. How, are the how is the strategy actually being implemented? The strategy, for a, strategy? for a sale, yes. So yeah. we're, we're developing that now. We've developed that in response to these expressions of interest, what the strategy uh, is. Uh, and that, that's predicated, as Gregor said, is what gets us to the objective. So the strategy is to realise those objectives. So the sale process needs to secure uh, a bidder, an owner, a future owner who wants to retain the airport as an airport, as an aviation business, and retain and maximise the economic benefit that results from that. But a strategy would imply that there is some proactive uh, effort being put in to achieving the ultimate aim of the sale? Yes. Is there? Yes. So we're working on that. Gregor's mentioned we, we, we've... You're worked. working on the strategy to do that? We're working, or you're... No, we're working on the strategy for a sale. So we're, that, that's the expertise that we've retained uh, at the moment from uh, external consultants. They are developing the sale strategy for us, with us, to deliver Minister's objectives. Okay, I'll, I'll let you off at that. Um, do you, how do you approach 
the assessment of potential investments as investments by the Scottish Government. You have key, key criteria you apply, uh, are there policy priorities that you wish to achieve? Yeah, I'll, I'll pass over to Greg. So, so, I, so I was just going to mention, I think the life cycle part is important because we have different objectives at different stages, but maybe Gregor will expand on that. Yes, so we, we, we've talked um, quite a bit, and I think Presswick is a good example, we've talked quite a bit about our objectives uh, for a sales uh, process for Presswick Airport, securing the future of the business as an aviation asset, being mindful of the importance of Presswick uh, for the local regional uh, economy. Also, absolutely trying to secure maximum uh, value for money uh, for taxpayers a return on the investment that has been made. So all of those criteria are important. As Dermot has said, we do have commercial advisors uh, appointed. They're already very much uh, 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 you know, progressing with the task of ensuring that we have an appropriate, uh, advising us uh, to ensure that we have an appropriate sales strategy in place and some elements of that are beginning to be put into uh, place. Um, ultimately the evaluation of expressions of interest that will be for the Scottish Government as uh, the shareholder and ultimate decision maker. The boards have an important role uh, to play. We will look uh, to them to offer advice and to recommend uh, a preferred bidder at the appropriate stage but then ministers will have the final say on any uh, offer. I will need to sign off on that as the accountable officer, so ensuring that the accountable officer tests are applied rigorously uh, to any sale. Um, but that sales process uh, and those sales objectives, uh, they will be uh, guiding lights uh, in uh, this process and indeed in any process to uh, exit from ownership of a strategic commercial asset. I mean, given the nature of the purchase of this type of asset, and I'm not talking specifically about Prestwick and Ferguson here, it's not surprising that when you take it on, the value of those assets will be impaired. And presumably, you take that into account when you're taking on this type of business. I mean, things like pension fund liabilities and so on are a huge issue. And you're unlikely to be taking over a business that is a going concern, at least in the initial stages. So you're going to have to have a strategy to obtain value for the shareholder, or in this case the, the public, uh, over, a, over a period. How, how do you manage that? How do you achieve that? So, so I might ask um, Colin possibly to, um, to expand on this, but look, th 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 this is where having a good, robust framework in place to guide decision-making is critically important. And the business investment framework, uh, which was, um, uh, I think we uh, 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 first produced that business investment framework just a couple of years ago, and I know it was updated uh, in October last year, but that framework is a really important um, uh, document uh, to guide uh, decision-making in those circumstances in just the way that you've described. And something like pension liabilities, I think that's an example of where being ready, able, uh, and um, uh, having the resources to very quickly do an appropriate degree of due diligence to understand exactly what liabilities the government would be taking on in those circumstances to inform a decision as to how that could be managed as part of a wider strategy for managing that intervention and being mindful of uh, a future exit strategy, these are all things that we've tried to bring to our approach through the Strategic Commercial Assets Division to the management of uh, assets of that, sh that sort to make sure that right from the very start um, we are doing things in the right way uh, and that we are clear on what are realistic objectives for the management of an asset. And the key, you've, you, you've, you've um, alluded to it yourself, one of the keys to, to, to ensuring uh, that degree of realism is to be clear about what the potential exit strategy is and in some ways to work backwards uh, from that. But the frameworks we've put in place, including the business investment 
framework. Mm -hmm. That is a really important part of the, the system that we now have to make sure that we get this right. So at the, at the start of this process, you have a, a process for determining what the true value of that business is, which might be zero, uh, given that it will be an impaired business that you're, you're taking on. So there will have to be an appetite for a degree of risk in taking this on, which might be covered politically or whatever in the final analysis. You talked about saving jobs, all that sort of thing. But you're not going to be taking on a business that is going to be viable, at least in the initial stages. You have to be able to assess that there will be a future value in this. It's going, to, it's going to have to break even at some point. How do you do that? Because often this is done quite quickly because there are, you know, the business is in distress, something needs to be done now, confidence has to be put back in. How do you do that? So, Colin may wish to expand on this, but the, 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 there are two things that I, I would, um, would emphasise. One is um, it is important that we can bring in the right... Um, sorts of independent external commercial advice at the right moment. So we've established frameworks for ensuring that actually we can very quickly procure that advice, the right sort of advice, so that it can aid decision making, recognising that those decision making processes will be very compressed. And it's important that it's independent because the risk if it's not independent, of course, is the optimism bias. Uh, will creep in. We will see opportunities where actually opportunities may not exist. So having credible, expert, independent, external advice that we can call upon in a timely manner to aid decision making, that's really important. We've put in place a system to ensure that we can do that and we can call upon it at the right time. You've mentioned you know, being clear on the risks and ensuring that that is built into the decision making process. As an accountable officer in these circumstances, that's my role. My role is to make sure that we are being honest and straight in our understanding of the risks and what the potential implications may be from a value for money perspective or indeed from a feasibility perspective from any intervention. So um, the AO process and the role that, that I would play as an accountable officer in these circumstances is very important. But I've got to be, I've got to be assured that we've got the right um, evidence uh, and the right information in order to make that decision and that it is consistent with the SPFM uh, and that I can come to a committee such as this and, and to justify uh, my role in that decision uh, making process. Perhaps just one last question. We talked about due, due diligence, but due diligence doesn't just stop at the point of purchase. What ongoing due diligence do you maintain over these investments? We've already um, uh, uh, referred to, to one uh, type of due diligence, which is if we have uh, a request uh, to fund an investment, uh, as we have in the case of Ferguson uh, Marine, uh, then it's important that we have a business plan from the yards uh, and absolute clarity on, on the commercial case uh, for that investment. And in those circumstances, we need to procure independent expert commercial advice so that we can be assured that the proposition would satisfy the commercial market operator test and therefore be compliant with subsidy control rules. We've, we've spoken on a, a number of occasions today about the whole life cycle model that the Strategic Commercial Assets Division has allowed us to introduce. One of those elements, the third element of that life cycle, is ongoing management. And that's where um, we would look at um, a focus on financial management, on risk management, um, and the process of sponsorship. And that's a you know, core function of the, the division. And that's why, for example, a member of SCAD um, sorry, the Strategic Commercial Assets Division is likely to be an observer on the board of a company that we would have an equity stake in. So those are the kind of things that we, um, we have at our disposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to bring the Deputy Convener in, but before I do, I've just got a couple of very quick questions and hopefully quick answers. Mr Rattigan, did you say that the Scottish Government's guarantee that was struck with the JFG alliance was also offered via Rio Tinto to the other four uh, prospective bidders? Yes. Yes, it was. Thank you. Um, secondly, uh, you said that um, because of global refinancing, 
uh, you thought that that would need to be completed before the investment in the billet plant would be made. What happens if that doesn't materialise? Well, for the, for the GFG Alliance, um, they, yeah, I'm sure you know because it's been reported, they were they were heavily reliant on uh, Green Greensill Sill Cap Capital. Capital and Green Sill Bank. Now, Green Sill failed in March 2021, and there was there was a lot of money that needed to be uh, essentially refinanced. So, Green Sill Capital went into administration. So did uh, Green Sill Bank. Um, GFG is in discussions with the, with those creditors. Now, I don't know the exact quantum, but what I've seen reported in the Financial Times was they're looking to refinance something like £5 billion worth of, of debt. So it's a very big number. Um, those parties have all stayed at the table for three years. GFG uh, tell us that they're making progress and they're, they're heading towards a deal. The three... The three creditors are working together consensually, but they'll have to decide uh, amongst themselves essentially who gets paid back first and what, what share they get of, of the resources that GFG can bring to the table. I don't think GFG will have the confidence in going ahead with their investment in Scotland until their global uh, refinancing is complete. Now, over quite a long period of time, since 2021, we've been seeking these updates, but we're not at those. We're not at the table for those discussions, so we get them only from GFG. They have made some progress. They've refinanced a business in Australia, which I think uh, was maybe the uh, the forerunner of the kind of deals that they want to do for the other businesses. But I think all of that has to now fall into place before I think they would have the confidence to invest in Scotland. The reason I said before we have uh, a degree of confidence uh, in them making the investment in Scotland is because they have invested in their carbon businesses. So particularly in the first few years of owning the smelter, the smelter was loss-making. Um, they put money into the business to cover those losses, so they've invested there. Um, the figure that was reported for the price of the sale from Rio Tinto again in the press was 330 million. So GFG bought into those businesses in Scotland uh, and they put money in since and we've seen some investment go into the planning of the development and the business have reserved some funds that we're able to see for the development. So, so those factors give us confidence. The thing that we have very little visibility about is really the position on the global refinancing. So we are reliant on GFG giving us assurances about that. OK. Um, and a quick question for Mr Irwin. Back in January before this committee, you told us that uh, for GFG Alliance, the appointment of auditors in the UK is a priority for it. Have they been appointed yet? I'm afraid I'll have to ask Dermot if there's been any progress on that. No, we, we ask about this at all of our meetings with GFG. Ms McAllen met with Sanjeev Gupta uh, around the end of March, 27th of March. She pushed this with him. What GFG say to us is they have made approaches to a number of uh, accountancy firms, auditors, etc. They have not been able to secure an auditor to take on the work. Companies House will be pushing them on that, but there's no there's no auditor of last resort, as I understand, in the UK. So there's no one that will step in if a business is unable to secure an auditor for the account. So it's a matter of concern for us. The Auditor General said it's a matter of concern for him. Um, the business would like to have an auditor, but they have not been able to secure one. Yes, and I think it's a matter of concern for the Public Audit Committee of the Scottish Parliament too. Um, Deputy Convener. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, my first question is, do you have any uh, women in senior leadership roles in those 40 positions? Because I just see a panel of men in front of me. We have, uh, we have five units. Um, so of the five, the five units are the, the, the grade that sit below me in the division. Um, of those, three of the five uh, are, are female and two are male. Good to know. Thank you. Um, on this issue of Lockerbie Smelter, what I've heard is quite concerning, and I'm sure we all would share that concern. My understanding is that the Scottish Government has committed to a 25-year guarantee 
Now, Audit Scotland estimated the exposure to the public purse as an estimated range of between 14 and 13, 14 million and 32 million per year over the course of that contract. So I guess my question is, uh, what is the current exposure, what's your current estimates of exposure uh, and how much to date, and if you don't have these numbers now you can write to us, how much to date of public money has been invested in the business? So we, as part of our uh, consolidated accounts, we have to make an assessment um, in relation to the contingent liability uh, of the Lacaber guarantee. So we have paid out no public funds under the guarantee. In fact, the, the guarantee is a revenue generating asset for the Scottish Government and it continues to be that. Uh, we receive uh, guarantee fees every quarter from the business. Mm -hmm. What we have to do under international accounting rules is to look at that contingent liability and take a realistic view uh, of, of what the exposure could be. So the exposure that we've reported in the last set of accounts is 135 million. We we get a, a specialist independent uh, firm who do that valuation for us. Um, it's driven to that number by a number of things. So it looks at a, a range of credit risk uh, scenarios. It looks at uh, all the cash flows of the business uh, that sit beneath the guarantee. And it takes a view. We have to, we have to assign a, a category of risk to the guarantee. Now, because GFG have lost their, their major financier, Greensill Capital, um, we treat them as if they're in default mm -hmm. in terms of that rating. So we, we score it as credit impaired and that drives then where we get to the value uh, of the expected credit loss. The, de the guarantee is not in default, but we've put it into the highest category of risk uh, on a prudent basis. That then drives... Um, that then drives calculations about how much of our assets you know, could be generated to sit against the guarantee, etc. And they take, uh, they take essentially you know, a big haircut off the value of the assets, etc. because we've put that rating on it. And now, uh, are, you, are you locked in for the full term of the contract? Is there any get out at all? The, no. There's the, with the way these guarantees work, there is, there is no get out uh, when you give a guarantee like that. But what, what you do... Um, is you, you take assets uh, or you, you have security over assets that back up the government's guarantee. So the first line of defence, if the guarantee was ever called, is we have cross-guarantees. So the companies that sit above the Lacaber businesses, all the group entities, have given us cross-guarantees. So we are immediately can call on those cross-guarantees from the group companies uh, to seek recompense. And then a second line of defence is we have security of the assets, we have step-in rights, etc., to operate the businesses if we, if we wanted to do that. Yeah. And what, what, what we've done um, since 2021 is an awful lot of contingency planning around the guarantee to understand what would happen if there was a default um, and how we would try and recover the government's position. But the last point I want to make is the 135 uh, million that we show as the uh, potential credit loss, that could never be called in one go. So the significance of those annual figures that you quoted is the guarantee payments are due annually, and we could never they could never be called up in one go. If those are default, what the government would have to do is make good the, the quarterly payments that go to the bondholders, uh, and they are in the range that you quoted uh, between. 14 million and 32 million over the life of the guarantee. Right, okay, so in other words, you can't back data, they can't accumulate annually. The, the, yeah. yeah, it can't be accelerated, the payments. I mean, there's a wider question. I'm looking at the, the major strategic investments of the last five to ten years by Fab, Ferguson, Loch Haber, and of course, Presswick Airport. And there seems to be a lot of government loans involved in a lot of these businesses. So obviously, there are different types of investment, there'll be strategic infrastructure investments and cash injections to, to do things and make those businesses better, but there's also straightforward cash injections as well. 
And it seems to be that many of these are simply being written off. Um, I presume those are political decisions made by ministers to write off loans. And if you look at the example of Bifab, it's around 50 million. There's about 45 to 50 million of loans to Presswick. There's at least 100 million in Ferguson, possibly more. It's quite hard to, to track down the numbers. But it's an awful lot of money, and it's an awful lot of public money. Can I ask who makes that decision as to whether loans are written off? And secondly, when you're looking at the future strategy or the exit strategy of these businesses, well, is it more than likely that these loans will not form part of any takeover strategy? Just on the valuation of those those financial instruments, we, we have to we have to make an estimate every year, and those are reported in our accounts and they're counted on. Um, in the Auditor General's report too. So say you take the loan, loans have gone into Glasgow Presswick Airport. We valued those loans. We take a realistic view on, on how much of that can be recovered. So we report that openly. So the, the Presswick loans are in the accounts, I think at 11.6 million pound. That's an estimate of what we think we could recover. But that, the difference between what we loan to the business and what we value the asset in now, that hasn't been written off that's been written down as an estimate, and then we have to do that. But that business, the Glasgow Presswick business, has returned to profitability. It's possible that we would we would revise that upwards. Uh, and again, with the Lacarbor guarantee, the expected credit loss that's driven that's driven by partly our assumptions about how how likely it is that the government that GFG can refinance and complete that, and also by essentially the price of energy, which drives the value of those assets. So that one changes too. Some of the, some of the money has been written off. So I think you, you mentioned BIFAB. That investment essentially is written off, but BIFAB is going through an administration at the moment. There's still the potential for the Scottish Government as a secured creditor to recover some of that money back from, from BIFAB. So I guess my question is, if you look at, there clearly has to be an exit strategy for, for these businesses, and you've got a whole department which looks at nothing but benefit realisation. I mean, is there a concern, though, that by doing so, is there any reluctance in your department to not return these to the private sector, these businesses as going concerns? Because effectively, you're talking your department out of jobs. If all four of these businesses went into pr the private ownership, there'd be no... SCAD, the 40 people would be doing something else in government, or uh, presumably. So, uh, what is the? Is there any conflict there between what you're doing and running these businesses and keeping them going, and a definitely we need, we want to get out strategy? The answer to that question is no. There is no conflict. Um, the, um, the the division, uh, I would say, helps to address any potential conflicts that could exist. For example, if work in this area was led by the team that leads on broader policy towards shipbuilding or um, transport. Uh, uh, so it, it, it provides a degree of objectivity and discipline in the decision-making process. Um, we, th th there are, um, we have a significant, um, we, we, th the team is absolutely committed to securing the best possible future for Ferguson Marine and for Presswick Airport, and we want to do that, and we want to reduce the size of the teams that need to currently support uh, those assets on a day-to-day -day basis, and that would be, um, uh, without doubt, that would be success uh, as far as we are concerned. But the problem is, and this is the problem I've got, is it's eight years almost to the day since I sat in a committee room three floors up from the one we're in now, and I, and I had a government minister in front of me and asked them what their exit strategy for Presswick Airport was. That was eight years ago. So, I mean, what faith can we have that, that, that this is, you know, that you guys are the ones that will deliver the exit strategies for Ferguson and Pressway, given that there seems to be a lack of progress on it either? I would say that there's been considerable progress. The business has returned to profitability. That's absolutely key for any successful exit strategy. The business is doing well. It has secured uh, a diverse uh, range of uh, sources uh, of revenue. Uh, it's a very vibrant business. Uh, it's a big employer. Um, we now have uh, a, a number of expressions uh, of interest. We have appointed commercial advisors. Uh, we are developing that sales strategy that's already quite uh, advanced. We have the right sort of decision-making 
um, framework in place uh, to support that. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we are doing what we can in order to do that in the right way so that uh, under the right circumstances at the right time, uh, we return Prestwick to private ownership. But the problem is this is the groundhog day that we've all heard before. And we've had people sit in committee rooms time after time saying exactly what you just said. Things are all heading in the right direction. There's lots of positive noise being made. And then it all falls apart and nobody knows why. Nobody knows who's bid. Nobody knows how much they bid for. Nobody knows the reasons why the bids were turned down by the government. And there's this general lack of transparency around the decision making about why ownership bids are refused or denied. So you're obviously advising ministers about these decisions. Can, is there any way you could increase the transparency around some of this? So we've already talked uh, about the objectives for a sales process and what ministers want to achieve and the importance in the case of Presswick uh, of securing its future as an aviation asset and its importance uh, for the economy and, and of course the importance of securing value for money for taxpayers. Um, it is inevitably the case uh, that um, uh, we will receive, I think, expressions of interest which are speculative. Uh, and after probing uh, appropriate due diligence, uh, we come to the conclusion that actually these people are not serious, they're not credible, they don't have a plan, uh, and certainly not a plan that will meet those objectives. In those cases, we will turn down, uh, we will um, uh, you know, stop considering uh, that expression of interest. Um, I would say what's different now is the business is in a position uh, where um, the opportunities and the potential of the business is now clear because it's demonstrating that it is successful and it's, it's successful in a number of different areas. So I think, and I don't think we've been in this position at all. I've only been in my role for 14 months. I don't think we've ever been in this position before, but now we can point to the business as a successful, thriving uh, business, and that's a good position to be in if you want to attract a wide range of expressions of interest and have a competitive process which allows us to realise um, uh, our objectives uh, for, for that sales process. Mr Cook, um, you, did you say you attend board meetings at Ferguson Marine? I do attend uh, board meetings at Ferguson Marine, either myself or my uh, uh, nominated deputy. And who's the current chairman of the board? Andrew Miller. And was he not the chairman of Presswick Airport? He was the chairman of uh, Presswick Airport, and he, yes. And he failed to return that to the private sector. Do you have confidence he can do the same at Ferguson? Um, I have a lot of confidence in the abilities of Andrew Miller, and I think the, um, the way in which, uh, as Gregor has described, Presswick Airport has been transformed and has turned itself into a profitable business. I'm, you know, I'm confident that Mr Miller was a very big part of that. And so why do you think David Tideman, the former chief executive, told the media two weeks ago that he had absolutely no idea why he was sacked? Well, look, the, um, as we've said earlier today, the, um, the rationale and the reasons um, for Mr. Tideman's sacking are a matter for the chairman and the board. Um, so did, and did they, Miller, they expressed Did he tell concerns. you the reason at all? I, have, I, I appreciate the job that David did. I watched him do it. I watched him do very good things in terms of building the confidence of the trade unions and the workforce. But at the end of the day, the chair and the board collectively decided that there were concerns about the performance of Mr. Tideman over a number of months or years um, relating to the delivery of 801 and 802 and other aspects of the organisation, and they made that decision. And that is a matter for them, and we support them in that. So why has there been so much churn at the top of these organisations? Why are you not able to hold down chief executives, well-paid chief executives well, of these companies? I, 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 don't, I think I might... Um, dispute the fact that there's been a uh, churn three, at the top of the Mr. Three Miller years, was so. chair of Ch Presswick Airport for a number of years. Mr. Black, um, obviously, as we've, des we've described, um, uh, stood down because of his involvement in a process. So there are reasons why the chair of those organisations would uh, had to be changed. Uh, Mr. Miller has been chair of Presswick Airport now for 18 months. Uh, David Tideman was chief executive for um, two years. Um, and so that, you know, a reasonable length of, of time. Um, and there were decisions taken about his performance in the same way as Mr. Tideman took decisions during his time in office to change members of his senior management team. All of that has happened, and that's normal in the course of uh, running a commercial entity. I want to move on to the uh, issue of the future of, of Ferguson. Um, the government, it's obviously publicly owned now, so it's fully funded by, by the taxpayer. Um, and 
in light of the questions posed about the small vessel replacement, you say that's a decision for the transport secretary to make, but are there any warnings being issued from your teams around uh, subsidy control or state aid issues that might prohibit their ability to direct toward future vessel procurement to Ferguson Marine? Or is that simply not an issue and it's more of a, a wider decision on whether, who, who's best placed to, to manufacture the vessels? And we've been working um, closely with our colleagues in transport throughout this process. Um, we clearly have taken advice on the business plan that has been submitted by Ferguson Marine, um, and that looks at the viability of that plan and any issues it might raise in terms of subsidy control and its ability to pass the commercial op market operator test. The information that we have, um, the views that we've arrived at, um, along with the perspective of the Board of Ferguson Marine, will all be made and has been made available to transport colleagues. Um, we, so we continue to work with them collaboratively. But ultimately, this will be a, you know, a, a transport decision in the sense that ministers need to make sure that, they, uh, that, the, that they're content with the procurement strategy that they decide upon for the small vessel replacement program. And, uh, that, that's up, that is their decision. Are you aware of any other potential business opportunities for the org? Um, I, I, the, um, the team at Ferguson Marine have a commercial arm, um, and I know that they are looking at some other opportunities. They have done work recently for BAE Systems, for example, and uh, I know they continue to talk with them and other potential customers going forward. Mr. Arm, maybe one sort of wider question, and that's, is it, it's a bit of a chicken and egg question. Is, is the business has obviously come to the government asking for support for many of the reasons you've, you've outlined. Um, which of these decisions are made purely as good business decisions and which are made or as political or strategic decisions? So are you directed by ministers to make something work if they choose to invest in a failing business? Or are you approaching ministers with opportunities and say these are businesses that you could invest in as a government? Which way round is it? So if, if you look at the four strategic assets that we manage, the decisions that were taken to um, support those businesses or to invest in them that were taken uh, many years uh, ago. So I, I personally have not been through that process. Um, however, what, 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 I, what I would say is that, uh, again, in my role as accountable officer, I would be very much focused on the value for money uh, case uh, for investment in a strategic commercial asset. I'd also be mindful of the wider economic benefits uh, from uh, an intervention, and that is something uh, that our ministers might uh, legitimately take into account in the case of both Ferguson's and Presswick, uh, they are very important for uh, the local uh, economies. They're very different assets. Um, Ferguson's the last commercial shipbuilder uh, on the Clydes. Uh, Presswick, um, uh, uh, you know, an increasingly diverse business with a unique asset in the form of uh, that long runway. Um, so those wider um, economic um, uh, interests um, are, are legitimate to take into account, but as an accountable officer, uh, I would also be very much focused on the value for money case for any intervention. Are there any other live uh, business investments that the government are looking at making that you're advising them on? Uh, the, there are no live uh, 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 propositions uh, in play at, mo at the moment. And how do you respond to accusations from the commercial sector in each of these markets that uh, government intervention in some, is in some way distorting the commercial market. And for example, take the issue of Presswick Airport, Glasgow Airport, we're very vocal about that accusation over the years. That is why we operate within a clear legal framework. We've already referred to the subsidy control framework and the importance of being able to satisfy a commercial market operator test, which requires you to act as if you were a commercial uh, market operator. Uh, so adherence to those legal frameworks is, is very important. Thanks, okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we've got some... Uh, I think Graeme Simpson wants one final quick question. Yeah, um, I do. Um, so, Ms. Mr Irwin, given that you've said that uh, there is a sales strategy for Presswick Airport, is it fair to say that Presswick Airport is for sale? 
we are looking to secure the best possible future for uh, Presswick Airport. As part of that, the government's objectives are very clear. We want to return uh, Presswick Airport to the private sector in the right circumstances at the right time. We, we are um, uh, open to expressions of interest uh, in Ferguson's and we have commercial advisors in place. Uh, we yeah, will... Press, Presswick. S sorry, Presswick, sorry. Um, uh, um, so, um, so, 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 yes, we're, we're very open to... So, so, yes. We're very open to expressions of interest. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Well, um, at the start of this morning, I said that we were hoping for some illumination, and I think we've had uh, quite a lot of illumination, actually. It's been uh, a useful session. We may still have some unanswered questions that we want to uh, put, and we may get back to you as a follow-up with those. But um, uh, can I thank you, Director General, for your time uh, and the range of questions that you've been able to field, uh, Mr Rattigan and Mr Cook as well, uh, in particular, can I thank you both for uh, the, um, the uh, answering of some uh, more far-fetched and difficult questions than perhaps you were anticipating before you came in here. But uh, I thank you very much for your cooperation. I'm speaking about my own questions. And so I, can, I, can I thank you very much indeed for your um, uh, cooperation this morning. And with that, I will move the meeting into private session. Thank you.